Hello, everyone. Welcome to Personalization Outbreak Podcast number eight. Today, we'll be talking to our guest, Dr. Tony Ortiz. He's the founder, principal investigator, and scientific director at NCR Research Institute, where he oversees the day to day clinical research for psychiatric indications for depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I know Tony personally, and I can say he's a highly ethical individual that stands by his word and as a scientist is in constant exploration of the truth. Along with Professor Dr. Scott Lacey, we'll be discussing one of the major side effects of the COVID-19 crises. And I'm not talking about the economy, I'm talking about mental health. Together, we will review how the pandemic has affected people in terms of anxiety and depression as well as the latest advancements in pharmacogenomics as the industry moves to a more personalized approach. Let's get started. You are listening to Personalization Outbreak, a podcast about the collapse of traditional corporate standards in today's more personalized world. I'm Glenn Yopis. I'm a leadership strategist, author, contributor to Forbes, and founder of the Leadership in the Age of Personalization movement. On this show, I'm interviewing executives across multiple sectors to find out how the balance between standardization and personalization can exist. Tony, thanks for being here. How you doing? Uh, uh, Glenn, I'm doing well. Thank you for the invitation and very and the kind introduction as well. That was very nice of you. Well, that's how I feel about you. And in the age of personalization, it's about getting to know each other as individuals. And so we're, we're certainly uh, excited to have you. So I have a, maybe an off-the-wall question for you, Tony. Sure. Uh, why are people naturally drawn to water in waves? Well, you know, that, that's an inter- inter- interesting question. And I have actually thought really deeply about this. But um, I think people gravitate naturally to water and waves. And I think from an unconscious standpoint, I say this from a psychodynamic way, from an unconscious standpoint, I think people are actually wanting to get back to the womb. You know, when we were a fetus in the womb at one point in time, uh, you know, there's actually an oscillation of waves going on of the amniotic fluids inside the womb. So I think people, when they go, they want to relax, de-stress, and they want to feel safe. So I think people naturally just go there to clear their mind and feel safe again. You make people feel safe given the current climate we're living in now. I mean, how, how can water and waves or uh, let's call it the scientific sides of it uh, perhaps give some sense of comfort to people? Well, uh, the thing that came immediately on, on my mind that I didn't really make a connection, but I think probably if you recall around a little bit before Memorial Day around mid, mid-May or so, um, or at the beginning of May, pe- people were actually going to the beach. Um, you know, I'm in the Orange County area, just as you, Glenn, and um, there was a lot of talk about people, um, you know, that the state was uh, really uh, criticizing um people going to the beach and taking walks on the beach and, and things like that. And I think the common question was, is like, why are people going to the beach? But I think during the pandemic and during the stressful time, people actually wanted to go feel safe, feel comfortable. Interesting. Scott, any perspectives on that? Um, I'm on the other side of the country, but also where there's so-called beaches, right? Uh, (laughs) But I tell you, it was the same thing over here. Uh, uh, We saw a lot of people literally just running out. I think, to, to just get try to pretend it was normal. Sometimes I think we just can, we need to turn it off for a minute and just uh, let the stress go and, and ignore the stressors knowing it's going to come back. But it just seemed like everybody that I was talking to that had seen, especially when our students came back to pick up their belongings, some of them stuck around and went to the beach and it was, they were looking to reclaim something that they felt that they, not that they felt they lost, but something they lost. So, well, I, I think on that note, in terms of what, what we can do to reclaim the things that we've lost. You know, Tony, why aren't we prepared enough for crises? I mean, shouldn't we have learned by now that we must always be in crisis management mode? 
Um, that's an interesting question, Glenn. Um, the thing that comes to my mind immediately is I think um, as technology has made things more efficient, more easy for us, I think we take for granted as a society that um, we're already prepared for these sorts of things. But, um, and I know that there's been bi biologists and, bi and virologists that have uh, warned about of uh, a pandemic uh, that was soon to be that was soon to occur. Um, no one really thought much about it because I think people uh, just tend to think that things are handled and and that we would be prepared. But obviously, that was not the case. So, how do you naturally tend to respond to to crisis, and and where did you learn that from, Tony? Oh well, um, I I think. Probably um, it, it's being in a crisis, your coping mechanisms tend to activate at that point in time. And so that your coping mechanisms are probably just a result of what you've gone through in your lifetime. And I don't know if you could tell in the way how I speak, but um, I suffered from a stuttering problem when I was, grow, when I was growing up. And um, it, it was really bad in my childhood. And so I've learned to uh, cope uh, at the throughout the years. And in those same coping mechanisms that I used when I was in third grade are actually the same ones that I use whenever there's a crisis going on, whether it's a pandemic, whether there's a, an internal problem going on in, in the workplace or interpersonal uh, relationships as well, if there's a crisis there. So um, tell us how you've coped with that. I mean, yeah. first of all, I, I'm really, I really appreciate you bringing that out to the forefront now, especially when you consider uh, let's just call it this, uh, all of this social um, injustice that we're, we're not going to talk about, but it really is bringing light to uh, the importance of one's individuality. And, you know, oftentimes people uh, don't feel safe in bringing up, uh, let's say, some of their own personal uh, vulnerabilities or concerns about how people might feel. What, what's allowed you to cope with something that you know is just part of your life? Well, I, I think um, with a lot of uh, disorders and even diseases that people go through in life, um, the number one thing that seems to uh, make people overcome their deficits or disorders or, or, or their disease states is their family support system. And fortunately for me, um, I had a very love, loving parents and um, they supported me along the ways. And um, uh, and, um, you know, I often said that I had like the Forrest Gump mom, you know, in terms of like, she always made me feel there was nothing really wrong with me. There was something wrong with some with, with everyone else. So I went through life, even though I had a really severe uh, problem in speech, um, that there was really nothing wrong with me when, um, when clearly there something was. And so I think family support is like the num number one thing. And then they also provided an ancillary type of services like speech there therapy as well. And when I was around eighth grade, I actually did have a really uh, great speech path pathologist at that time that actually uh, made me get through uh, a lot of the deficits that I went through. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, really, I really appreciate that. So, so now let's, let's shift the topic uh, yeah. to what is at the core of your work at, at NRC, and that's mental health. Right. Uh, and according to a, a new national survey led by researchers from Northeastern, Harvard, Northwestern, and Rutgers University. Uh, this study shows that as the U.S. enters the fourth month of the COVID-19 pandemic, more than a quarter of U.S. residents, and it's 27% to be exact, describe symptoms in a range that would be considered moderate or severe depression. Now, this figure Tony, and you may have read this already, is more than three times higher than what has normally been observed in large national surveys. Can you maybe unpack these findings and this comparative for us? Well, I think um, the way how we could kind of think about it in this way is uh, the, pandem the pandemic brought a stressful situation. It, it was a trig trigger. So whenever there's a trigger that happens, um, there's a variety of disorders that an individual might be predisposed to. So um, in a lot of cases uh, in my work and in my practice, we actually have seen an increase in depression 
an increase in anxiety and it also in an increase in post-traumatic stress disorder, which we always, always uh, say as PTSD. And so those, those are the three main uh, disorders that we have seen that have been on rise. Um, I don't deal much with suicide as well, but um, I did see an interesting fact that um, someone um, said that for every 1% of the unemployment rate that goes on, uh, the suicide rate goes up by 1 to 1.6% per percent ah. in, in the population. So I thought that was a very fast, fascinating stat. So, Tony, tell us a little bit more about triggers. Like you, you had mentioned that this pandemic was a trigger. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, give us a sense of, um, I mean, I've got to believe that, I, and again, you know this, I, I'm just trying to make some sense of it. If on a scale of one to 10, this has got to be up there into the nine or 10 range, if not 12, of a trigger. Explain to us maybe some of the different triggers that, that really propel mental health. And, and again, uh, much like you shared something personally, uh, personal, I'd like to do the same. And, you know, I've been dealing uh, with mental health, in particular anxiety, for, for many years. Uh, and so I get a sense of what my triggers are. Tell us more about these triggers, uh, because I actually believe, and I learned, I've I, just having met as many people and, as no, and have known as many people as I do, I almost feel that we've all had some sense of mental health uh, disorders in our life because of the variability of all of these triggers. So fill in some gaps here, but I just maybe thought you can expand more about Expand more yeah. um, well, the triggers um, they occur every day in in nature. Actually, um, you know, uh, it's just more of a difference in the magnitude that they present themselves. Um, you could be triggered by someone that smirks at you in, in like the wrong way, and you could get go into a rage for whatever reason. But um, there's triggers that happen in everyday life, and then there's these um, these triggers that are more histor historical in nature that like for example um you know you know you could um you know unfortunately there could be someone that's going through a divorce um that could trigger them to kind of spiral into depression or or increase their anxiety in some way yeah. but the pandemic is a trigger that's of the same um it, that's an equal or greater mag magnitude to what major triggers in our lifetime tend to occur. You know, um, so I think what the pandemic, you know, you, you put like a rating scale of like nine, nine, nine or so, but I think the pandemic from a scale from one to 10 could be considered around the nine to 10 range, just considering what has been going on of the shutdowns, people losing their jobs, people being laid off and and furloughed and things like that. So the trick, so the trigger of, of the pandemic is I, I would also rate it between nine and 10, depending on where, on where you look at it. So um, how do we recover from something as seismic as this pandemic in terms of our mental health? I, you know, I, I've just witnessed, uh, for example, you know, my mother and in others that are elderly, uh, it seems that from depending upon your age generation, I mean, there's many variables, socioeconomic, it's, it's impacting us all uh, at, at, at very varying degrees and levels. But what do you say to someone who's dealing with mental health right now um, in terms of how they recover from these types of triggers? Yeah. Well, the recovery rate is really dependent on how resilient the individual is. Um, you know, and the resilience is really um, like a function of coping mechanisms that one has. So um, the more coping mechanisms that you have developed in your lifetime, the more likely that you're able to uh, cope with the situation, the stressful pandemic uh, sit situation and continue to carry on. Now, someone that um, what, what kind of concerns me the most are, are people that were already sort of in the moderate to severe range in their severity of whatever mental illness or mental health issue that they might have. Yeah. And um, this could have most likely propelled them if they were sort of in the moderate impaired range, the pandemic could have um, increased them to the severe range. Um, so th those are really the ones that, that kind of concern me the most. Um, now, someone that has minimal mental health issues, um, you, know, you know, they might have some reserves, you know, within their coping mechanisms that, you know, 
right right about this time as as we're kind of as I'm assuming on the tail end of the pandemic here, you know, um, despite the second surge that's going on, um, I think people are feeling a little more comfortable and they're feeling they're going out into the public more. They're interacting with friends and relatives. So some of these people that maybe had a um, an increase in, in mental illness symptoms around March, April, and even at, in in May as well, um, those people are probably already improving on their on, on their mental health. That's that's the assumption I have, especially just because of the patients that I've seen in my private pra- practice and and in, in the research here as well. Scott, any how do we t- bring this back to humanity? Um, I mean, it seems to me that uh, we're dealing with triggers all the time, and and not just that. It, this you know how can this potentially this pandemic uh, make us all a lot more resilient. Uh, what What are your thoughts on that, Scott? Um, I think we just heard a case example from Tony, right, Tony? I mean, you're just saying that this time around, it's only been a couple months, really, that where we even became familiar with this to the point where we recognized the the gravity of the situation, and here we are facing even as much ambiguity, if not more, than we ever had before, right? Some things have been solved or not solved, but figured out, or at least we can predict it more, and others not. Um, and so, so I think that was enough to kind of build us some resilience, uh, moving, moving, I guess, on from that ambiguity a little bit. But something I'd like to ask you is about this ambiguity. Um, one thing I'm noticing across sectors, uh, whether I'm reading about it or just talking to people, is um, I can't figure out why people are so afraid of ambiguity. Um, when we're playing with word games, Another word for ambiguity is freedom, <laughs> right? Like it's not spelled out for you, right? Yeah. And, and so, so for, for me, you know, I, I'm thinking there's definitely a lot of tough stuff to, to be grappling with right now, but, um, but the conversations haven't yet turned to where, where's the opportunity to innovate and fix. And I think with, uh, with the Black Lives Matter and some of the most, uh, most impressive social movement action I've seen in my entire lifetime, it, it seems like we're, we're gaining some ground, but it seems like it's, it's pandemic related, but not. Um, is Black Lives Matter and the social movement that's, movements that are, are moving right now and gaining momentum, do you think that's a way for us to deal with the ambiguity of the disease? Ah. Oh. You know, there, there's, well, you know, you, you bring up the ambi- ambiguity, and I think yeah. what, what kind of came up in my mind immediately is that people want to feel a certain level of certainty. And um, when you don't feel certainty, you, your, your mental health symptoms start to go up, and more, more likely, like, your anxiety begins to go up. And I always like to make par- parallels to the stock market because it tends okay. to affect mood a lot. You know, yeah. when, when, and, and the stock market behaves in that same exact way. When there's uncertainty and there is, there's am, ambiguity in life um, or, in ver- in, or in economic ver- variables that they see, the stock market tends to crash. Um, that's when the sell-offs begin. So I think people tend to want to uh, feel a certain level of cer- certainty because um, the more as ambiguity increases, your anxiety increases as well. So I would say there's a di- direct proportion be- yeah. uh, between ambiguity and with anxiety. You know, ambi- go ahead. Can I just ask one more about the ambiguity? Because I'm just thinking, is ambiguity easier, easier um, if you're not in the stock market, so to speak? And I'm just basically saying, is ambiguity less of a issue in terms of for folks that aren't trying to protect uh, a status quo? Um, because it seems to me that um, ambiguity, like I said, could be freedom, but yet we're so afraid of it. But I can now understand that, for example, if I am heavily invested in the stock market, I do not want ambiguity because that's going to change everything and I can't predict the rest. Versus if I'm on the other side and I really can't even afford to take care of my meals or my family. Um, I'm okay with a little ambiguity because can't get much worse than this, I don't think. Yeah. Oh, well, um, I try to connect it. I didn't do a good job on that, but I was trying to connect the ambiguity with human decision at the end of the day. So I think okay. when, when people make a human decision, no matter what it is, uh, find, finding a meal or what, or, or what you're going to do next, um, I, I think people, before they make a decision, they like to be certain about, about the conditions of what's going on. 
And so, and I think once the am- ambiguity begins to increase, so the more uncertainty that that increases, I do see that anxiety tends to increase as well. So, and, and I think, and that's what the anxiety does. Once, once you have an increase in your anxiety, your, your thought process and your rationalization tends to get crip, crippled a long time. That's, that's, that's my view, but. Well, so, so let's, it's interesting. So let's bring this back to um, this, this paradox between uh, the age of standardization and the age of personalization, because I actually believe that this tension between the two um, is giving rise to ambiguity. What, what, what do I mean by that? Is in the age of standardization, everything was based on efficiency models, uh, predictability models. It was created mm. to create and define and predict certainty. And now that uh, we're in this world where it's become more personalized than ever before. Uh, and now that as as you mentioned, Scott, people feel like they have more freedom uh, again, in this case, because they can work from home um, or, or they're not subjected to go into the corporate environment where perhaps uh, people feel a little bit um, uh, careful about how they deal with these types of things that, now they're having to, the freedom to deal with these things on their own in the comfort of their own home. But, but what I'm also seeing now, especially because of this social unrest, that we're seeing this personalization that is almost headed to an extreme level. Um, at, at the same time, uh, the people that are leading organizations are and have historically been incentivized to practice standardization um, are now also trying to lead these things that have become more influenced by how personal things are in people's lives, whether it's, you know, COVID or, or the social unrest. And I feel that these two things are now operating in the extremes. And with the extremes comes even that much more ambiguity. Where am I going with all of that? With people, I, I see an environment now where people just want to know what to do. In other words, how am I responding to this social unrest? How am I responding to all this freedom? How am I responding uh, to leaders that maybe are uncertain themselves with how to respond? And yet, this world of standardization that was defining and has historically defined the individual, it's always been about directing and telling the individual what should they do. And I actually believe, again, this is no, there's no statistics behind this. This is just what my gut feel is in the work that I've done and in knowing how personalization has really impacted an an individual's ability to do things on their own terms uh, and in wanting to influence things in their own ways. Now we have individuals that are under this crisis and they're saying, what do I do? They've always expected direction, yet they've always wanted freedom. And now that we've reached this, th- this level of uncertainty, now they want more direction. And without that direction, I believe that people are, are feeling more mental strains and more stressors, and to your point, more triggers that maybe they hadn't experienced in the past. So uh, I know I said a lot there, Tony, but how do you react to that? Because I think we're entering a whole other world that is requiring one to take action and to be more self-directed, but yet they've never were told that they can do that in the past. And now when the moment calls, we're stuck. Mm. Thoughts? Yeah, well, um, I think there's a certain um, percentage of the population that um, basically essentially want to be told what to do. Um, they want to get some some direction from some, someone. But then there's a certain level. Uh, there's, there's, and then there's another uh, certain percentage of the population that are going to thrive in that environment. So um, I, I guess it would, from a management standpoint in the workplace, I guess it's to find 
those in individuals that do thrive in that type of setting because um if for the most part um on, you know you you almost or or there could be just some education um in in regards to during these uncertain times um encourage people to make their own decisions encourage people to explore you know things might not be certain at this point in time but this is the perfect time to start your exploration and so you know so let's go back to mental health when yeah. you're now being asked to experiment and maybe you don't know how even though you've always wanted to i mean how do you, my whole point is it how do these dynamics impact people mentally right well, I mean, it's a lot to handle yeah um and 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 i think that that's why i kind of kind of go by with the whole prem, premise of the, that there's a certain percentage of the population that will react in a favorable and positive way on that. And um, I, I think during, um, it, well, there was so, sort of uh, a situation like that in terms of uh, how is this, you know, we're doing, we're doing research uh, clinical tri trials here. How is this pandemic going to affect the research study? So what happened during this time is that some companies advised us to halt recruitment for the studies because they didn't want to deal with the confound variable of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then some decided, hey, well, let's continue on. Let's, uh, this is part of life. Uh, you know, there, um, uh, and, and, and so it, it was interesting because no one could really come up with a decision and, and it really just came down to the research sites to, kind of under the guidance of the FDA and what the pharmaceutical companies um, hmm. uh, de decided to do. So they essentially left it up to us and a lot of ways on how to deal with uh, the decisions on how to continue on with the research studies. Tony, could I just add a quick one? Uh, yeah. Hypothetically, uh, Glenn and I have a company and uh, we're asking you to do some testing for it. And to be honest, we uh, really want direction from, from you. Um, can you tell us um, what do you think we should do and what do we gain and lose by by continuing to to, to do this study uh, as opposed to pulling it out to, to get rid of this difficult variable? Yeah, well, um, I, I guess it, it would really just come down to um, what what are you trying to evaluate? So what um, therapeutic indication are you trying to to evaluate here? Um, you know, there there could be um, uh, some you could do like an inter uh data analysis to determine if there's been any effect at all but um you know it 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 would really um i, I really what what they did to us i would defer the decision to <laughs> to you guys as well so right. because it's it's your company at the end of the day but um given um what was going on um because we actually did work during the pan pandemic we never did shut down because we were considered an essential business business here. So what we did do is um, we did provide a lot of uh, protective gear just to make sure that the patients yeah. felt safe, that the staff felt safe. Um, and we continued through, you know, with all the ambiguity and the uncertainty of what was going on, especially towards the last uh, weeks of March and the and all and 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 all of April. So um, we were actually going on a day on on a day by day, um, and we did do see we did do, we did see an increase in anxiety and increase in 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 like depression as well. But the way how I also saw this as well, I saw this more as um, well. No matter what, this could there's always a milestone that's going to occur to some someone. Um, this this data could have been skewed by personal effects as well by oh, divorce. Right by a marriage even. Um, so, so we consider this more as part of life mm -hmm. as, um, yeah. So, so Tony, what, what are some of, um, some myths about mental health? Uh, and you can take that wherever you want that, that maybe certain people who are listening or watching right now are mm -hmm. unaware of. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I think, um, there's different cultures um for example in the latino culture um mental health is not seen as a positive um you know um and, and in fact um you know a lot of people um in my culture and and our and our culture glenn um there's a stigma associated with mental health um you, you know like i think right at this point in time i think um 
mental health issues like depression and anxiety, it's a little more accepted these days, but other mental health issues like bipolar disorder or even schizophrenia, it's not really um, perceived as a positive thing. And there's a lot of stigma associated with it. Um, so I, th I think um, some of the myths in mental health, at, at least in the Latino culture, is that um, there's um, that that schizophrenia is not a disease or it's not a disorder that um that it's some some something that you could kind of cure with herbs or something like like that hmm. um or, or or exercising more where whereas um you know uh, um whereas schizophrenia it's actually it's actually a lifelong disorder and, sure. and um I, I at least i come from the perspective that that it should be maintained with med with medications um, and with therapy at the same time, um, but that's not in that's not in an accepted uh, 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 form of treat treatment in 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 the Latino cold culture at this point in time. So, what would you say to someone who maybe um, thinks that they have a mental health problem, but you know they're uncertain? What what are things that they can they can do? I'm, I know that they can go to their physician there or PCP and start the process. But, you know, just if you were speaking to them, like what, what, how would you explore this with them? Well, it's, it's an, ex, 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 it's an exploration prop process. Uh, the biggest thing in mental health is that you need to create insight within yourself. Um, you got to accept that maybe there is a problem with you. And one form of that um, is maybe seeing a psychologist, seeing a therapist of some sort, maybe talking the sim symptoms out. If they're not comfortable with that, I know a lot of primary care physicians, family practice physicians that actually do um, act as psychologists and therapists in some way because they actually begin to talk about and explore the symptoms with them. And then may maybe starting at the primary care level, then once they get comfortable with the fact that, well, may maybe I might have a mental health issue, maybe I should go see a ther therapist. Um, that's, that's the process that I tend to see. And what are some of uh, the advancements in, in research, things that, that your organization is doing uh, to help, you know, to, to create further advancements for treatment and cures? What, what, what are you seeing? Yeah, well, um, we deal with a lot of uh, novel compounds that are experimental. Um, they they um, are working on different mechanisms of actions than what's available right now in, in the marketplace. Um, actually, last year was a very interesting year because um, there were um, several, several medications that got approved for for uh, diff different uh, diseases like and and different disorders. Like for example, uh, the first medication for postpartum depression was was approved by 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 the FDA. Mm -hmm. And then there is also um, um, in there is a ketamine derivative drug um, that's referred to as esketamine. That uh, medication was approved by the FDA for. Mm -hmm for depression and actually that was a very in, interesting medication that got approved because it it's very different from the rest of the medications that are out there the most common medications for depression right now are the usual things um, um, like Prozac and Zolo and Zoloft which have been for se for for se for several years now for 20 plus years well for third for over 30 years now so this um, so the esketamine drug um, is actually the first medication that got um, that got approved for depression that has a novel mechanism 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 of action so and if you kind of get the word of ket, ket of ketamine it's actually related to the to the street drug of um, special K but they do it in a micro dose and it's form emulated and 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 it's standardized so um so on that note uh, as as our populations and their cultural demographics uh, shift, um, I mean, again, you're the expert here. How do you think research methods will evolve as we tr you know try to provide more personalized care, especially to these patient populations that uh, such as Hispanics or African Americans and others that maybe haven't always felt so welcomed uh, into uh, these uh, 
clinical trials and 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 into the healthcare industry in general. And I mean, do you see that perhaps with and again as numbers rise in mental health because of COVID nineteen that you know we'll we'll have to look at research a little bit differently for these uh, through these more ethnically diverse groups that uh, will play a bigger part of the healthcare ecosystem. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, there, there is, um, there has been a, a movement in diversification in the ethnic pop populations that we see in in the United States because um, most of um, the trial participants on the nationwide level, um, they're usually ca Caucasians and African um, Americans that participate mm -hmm. in the clin in the clinical trials, and it's you know sub subject to to the demographics as well. Um, and, you know, there's a percentage of, of Latinos and, uh, and of Asians as well, but there's a diversification of move movement going on because, um, the, because the reality is, is that um, a lot of these medications do have ethnic differences, at least on how they're metabolized in, mm. in, in, in the body in the body there's evidence that a certain medication at a certain dose level for a caucasian individual might differ uh for mm -hmm. an asian and and for an asian individual um and then another point that i wanted to make that kind of reminded me of what you were saying is that from 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 the age of pers personalization uh there's a big movement in pharmacogen genomics right now where um you could actually take a genetic test and that genetic test is personalized to your genes, and it gives you an output of data, data that suggests what type of medication might be uh, might work. Hmm. Um, so um, it, it could be for like, say, if um, you're looking to get it to use an ant an, an antidepressant, um, the pharmacogenomic uh, analysis will indicate on what type of antidepressants might be more effective for you. So you remind you reminded me about that, Glenn. Is that right now in psychiatry, it's kind of um, um, oncology tends to be far more advanced compared to mental health. But right now, um, psychiatry is working on a personalization level where they're actually looking at the genes and they're looking at what medications might be better suited for the patient because. In mental health, what a psychiatrist does, a psychiatrist is the is the prescribing provider. They usually, unfortunately, kind of just experiment. Well, we're going to give you this antidepressant, and we'll check how you're doing in four weeks. Yeah. And um, and if you tolerate the medication, and and if the medication is effective, you remain on that med medication. But you might come back after four weeks and say, oh, um, you know, this medication. I'm suffering from a lot of side effects. Um, the psychiatrist will usually put you on a different type of medication. So now with the phar pharmacogenomics revolution that's going on, um, medicine, especially in psychi psychiatry, is becoming a little more personalized now. Mm -hmm. And they are targeting medications that might be more effective according to your genetic pro profile. Interesting. Well, so fascinating. I, I didn't know about that. It's, it's great that those advancements are, are in order. So. To kind of wrap it up here, and as we look into the future, I'd like for you to, to just react to the following statement. Yeah. Um, without strategy, change is merely substitution, not evolution. How do, you, how do you react to that statement? Without strategy, change is merely substitution, uh, not evolution. Oh, well, I mean, that just comes down to uh, planning. Uh, stand that point. Um, I th I think in uh, whatever you know, kind of going back to the ambiguity uh, uh, mm. question. Um, like I think uh, planning tends to create a certain cer cer certainty. Um, so I think plan planning is essential and part of and part of the strat and part of the strat and part of the strategy here. So yeah. that, that that makes me think of studies in terms of well being um, about uh, the planning where uh, essentially it's a pop sort of pop study but it's a real true research study mul multiple ones about vacation and what's your best day of vacation in terms of your happiness and well-being level and apparently it's the day before you leave yeah and and so <laughs> no, so I right didn't know yeah. that. that makes sense yeah. and that's like what it peaks and then as soon as you go you're already thinking well it's over already because i only got six days left and so might as well just not even have fun anymore right you're, you're already planning to be done with it and so right. i just think that i really wanted to just mention that because i thought it went really well with what you were just saying it, it kind of oh, sparked me man yeah, oh, I, the I, planning I, yeah. the yeah, planning um, as a strategy 
Yeah, um, I have to keep that pop pop stu- that pop study in mind. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so how do so how do we as species, um, Tony, recognizing that we're all dealing with some level of, I won't say mental disorder, but mental stressors. Um, what, what do you see here happening into the future? What, when do you, what do you think the future is of, of mental health? Uh, what has COVID-19 taught us? And, and maybe what are some parting thoughts about um, how we can continue to find uh, and explore coping mechanisms? Yeah, um, well, I think in terms of the COVID situation and mental health, um, I think um, as we go along on a daily basis here and having an understanding of the virus infection rates and death rates, I think people internalize those var- variables in, in, in their minds. And however they look at it, they make a decision based on that, um, thinking, okay, things are going to be fine. Um, I'm going to get back to work soon. Um, I, may, I may be able to go out or I may stay in. Um, and I think um, as we get more understanding, more certainty, of what is going on, um, people feel more apt at, um, at, at, at socializing at the end, at the end of the day. And then that kind of tends to, um, maybe plateau the mental health symptoms. And and this occurs with, with, I, I would say this occurs with the, uh, with people with minimal mental health issues and even people that are suffering from mental health mm-hmm. at, at this point, at this point, at this point in time. How do we plan for unknowns in mental health? Wow. Well, that's uh, <laughs> well, that's the ambiguity, right? <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I didn't plan to ask you, but you know, the more I've listened to you, uh, you know, I, I think that this uh, this issue of uh, planning for the unknowns is is really what we're all struggling with, not just uh, right with business, but in our lives and as individuals, like how do we get our heads around grappling with unknowns? In, in, how, in, in fact, how would you rate the unknown on a scale of one to 10 as a trigger? Hmm. Well, well, that's what I was gonna say. Oh, oh um, um, Scott, were you about to react? Um, I, no, I wanna hear you, I'm excited. <laughs> oh, well, no, no, um, I think um, you would, if you're constantly concerned about the unknown, um, your anxiety is never going to go down. You're always going to be um, on an anxious level to, to begin with. So I think what, in my personal opinion about all this, um, you have to accept that the unknown is part of life. And might it be possible if we are truly going to sort of walk the walk with this personalization, um, is it possible that there's some of us that dig ambiguity? A hell of a lot more than knowing and the certainty of what's ahead and vice versa. I can think of maybe why some people like um, kind of avant-garde jazz or Sun Ra versus right. people that might want to hear Bach. And right. like, that's a pretty big continuum. But um, I can now see that I already understood and appreciated how complex what you do in terms of your research is because I think mental health research has been personalizing doing personalized uh, personalization research for a long time, even if it was at first experimenting. What they're recognizing is, look, you're unique and we're going to try some things because there isn't an answer for everybody. So we're going to find yours. And so I just really appreciate uh, what you've been teaching us and sharing with us today, because ultimately I'm gaining a lot of um, uh, appreciation for ambiguity that I didn't have before, but I'm also gaining a lot of appreciation for Certainty. I'm one of those ambiguity cats. I want to hang out with Sun Ra more than Bach. And, and, and because I don't really know what's going to happen next. And that's what makes me excited about the next. Um, and so I'm going to be a little bit cooler now to people that really love the certainty because you helped me see that uh, that's another color crayon in the crayon box, man. Thank you so much. Oh, well, well, that's very nice, nice of you to say, Scott. Well, Tony, look, outstanding. This has been um, extraordinarily insightful. And, you know, you've, you've actually made me think, I mean, when you brought up resiliency, um, you know, again, I don't know if this will inspire or at least hopefully provide perspective, but I think it's healthy to take risks. And I think that 
you know, it's risk taking for me that has actually helped me become more resilient. And as we're thinking about all the uncertainty and all the unknowns, uh, think about all the things, and I'm sharing this really with, to our listeners and viewers, that think about those things that maybe you didn't act on before. Uh, think about those things that you wish you would have uh, now that you know that uh, nobody has all the answers. Uh, and just go for it. I mean, we need to start building our own uh, resilience because what's next is a world that will require much more self-directedness. And that's what's going to help us strengthen humanity. That's what's going to help us uh, become greater contributors to society. Um, and I think this is where we can begin to uh, explore and find that balance between standardization and personalization, because that's not going to happen automatically. And it, 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 it's going to take people with resilience and people that recognize that you, you, can do, you can't do things on your own. And, you know, as Scott knows, and he's talked about extensively, is that, you know, we're becoming uh, more and more interconnected and interdependent uh, on each other. And my whole point in saying this is that there's a lot of people out there, for those that are listening, that have the same concerns, have the same worries, have the same stressors as a lot of people out there. The whole point is that I think that this pandemic is, in, in a very interesting way, going to bring us bring about a, a greater sense of unity because we're going to find uh, the commonalities that we've always had in our differences that have been brought about by a pandemic that's been so personal and has affected us in, in, in many ways. So thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today on Personalization Outbreak. Thanks for listening to Personalization Outbreak. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. If you enjoyed the content, visit ageofpersonalization.com to check out our free streaming video series and learn how to get involved in the movement. I'm Glenn Yopis. I wish you a good day. And remember, without strategy, change is merely substitution, not evolution.